Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I, I very much enjoyed the music, the welcome music, as people were <laughs> entering the room in the geographically convenient Zoom room. Um, I'm zooming in from the United Arab Emirates to host today's session, yeah. and I would um, I make it four o'clock on the dot. And yeah, I think um, the Institute of Directors are very timely people and respect time, so I think we should. Um, get cracking uh, for today's session. So good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you're in the uh, in the uh, the states. And welcome to the first webinar of the 2024 boardroom webinar series by the Institute of Directors, where innovation meets tradition, ideas converge, and strategies evolve. Oh, we sounded like we had a traffic jam there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank my you. name, yeah, my name is Julie Lewis, and I'm absolutely delighted to be your host today. And I can see many, many more people are still zooming in. Um, the boardroom webinar series is supported by our institutional partners, Gujarat Flora Chemicals and Bitscore Cybertech LLP, our strategic partner, NASDAQ, and a knowledge partner, Taxman. And I can see people are still coming in and we are right on the dot. As you may know, the theme of today's webinar is staying vigilant, due diligence for independent directors. Now, stepping into the role of an independent director involves a series of critical evaluations and understanding of numerous aspects of the companies you'll be serving. So this webinar is focused on how to take up independent director role with courage and confidence. We are absolutely delighted to have an extinguished, distinguished lineup of speakers and experts who will share their experience-based wisdom and insights through their conversations ahead. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. If for any uh, chance you are watching uh, this on a phone, may I suggest that you put it on landscape so that your view would be better. Uh, I'd like to let you know that we will have a Q&A session towards the end of around 15 minutes and the chat will be enabled during this session. So keep your questions in mind and we will answer those towards the end. And also a reminder to all our beautiful distinguished speakers to be very conscious of their time slots so that we can flow um, and manage this webinar um, uh, well. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm very happy to see such a good response taking place here. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the IOD's 2024 boardroom webinar series. So this is the beginning of those series and I'm pleased to see such an active participation from the directors community who have gathered here to join us for a session on the theme, staying vigilant, due negligence, due diligence for independent directors. Now, due diligence for independent directors is an important aspect. Now, this topic is not only timely, but also critical in the current corporate landscape, where the role of independent directors is increasingly under the spotlight. Since our inception as IOD in 1990, IOD has been pioneering a silent revolution within the boardrooms. Our mission has always been to promote responsible leadership and drive economic prosperity through effective governance. Today's theme resonates deeply with the core principles of the IOD. Due diligence is not merely a procedural obligation, it is the bedrock of effective directorship. Independent directors are entrusted with the responsibility to be inquisitive, ask the right questions, and critically assess the information presented to them. It requires a very proactive approach to identifying potential risks, 
evaluating business strategies, ensuring that decisions made are in the best interest of all stakeholders, and finally, adding value to the board decisions and the company's performance. Independent directors must also gain an in-depth knowledge of their respective industry and have the moral courage to speak up in the boardroom if they find or suspect anything unethical behavior in the company. The current landscape of corporate governance presents a myriad of challenges. From navigating regulatory challenges, changes, and market volatility to addressing technological disruptions and ethical dilemmas, the need for vigilance has never been more pronounced before considering a position on a board as an independent director. It is essential for you to undertake a thorough due diligence process that our distinguished guests of honor and panelists will discuss today in great details. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are indeed very happy and privileged to have very experienced and very knowledgeable panelists on for this discussion today. And I am sure that all, all uh, ideas pertaining to the corporate governance and the responsibilities of independent directors will be very well covered by them by them in great details. Independent directors, they are the guardians of corporate governance. They must remain more vigilant and continuously update themselves, stay abreast of the latest developments and adopt practices to meet the evolving demands of their roles. A commitment to due diligence and vigilance is essential in building trust and maintaining the confidence of shareholders, employees, and the community. Today's webinar is an excellent opportunity for all of us to delve deeper into the intricacies of due diligence. We are indeed privileged to have a distinguished panel of experts who will share their insight, experiences, and best practices. Their collective wisdom will undoubtedly equip all of us with the knowledge and tools needed to excel in the role of an independent director. Independent directors, as you know, have a very, very great responsibility on their shoulders and they have to keep themselves updated what is happening in the boardroom, what are the new technologies which are emerging, how best these technologies can be utilized for their respective industry, and know fully well as to what, how the, uh, the current culture of the organization is, because ultimately you have to fit into that organization. And my advice with my experience is, that initially when you join a board, a board for the first two, three board meetings or for the first couple of months, it is better to understand the functioning of the boardroom, understand the personalities which are there inside the boardroom and gain as much of knowledge as possible first. Go through the agenda points in great detail before you attend the board meetings if any information has not been provided adequately in the agenda points, as independent directors, you are well within your rights to ask the management to give you that information and they are obliged to give it to you. So keeping that in mind, uh, I, I am very certain that all these aspects will be covered in great detail by our distinguished panelists. And I would like each one of you to actively participate, engage in meaningful discussions, and take full advantage of this opportunity to learn and also to do networking. I wish you all a very productive and an enlightening session.
I will now hand over to the pan distinguished panelists. Thank yes, you so, so much, Lieutenant General Nath, for that beautiful, warm welcome. Very, very conscious of, uh, of the timing as well, so perfect. It's now my great honor to introduce our next 16 guest of honor, Dr. G. Malingam, Independent Director on multiple boards, including LIC, DSP, Pension Fund Managers, Care Rating, CDSL, IIBX, all of the alphabets of the letters, IL and FS, City Union Bank, and many other distinguished boards and former whole time member of SEBI. Mr. Gormuthi Malingam has over four decades of experience in the financial industry, covering financial market security regulation, debt and forex management, and banking supervision. He has held roles such as chief dealer and executive director of the Reserve Bank of India, where he managed forex interventions, reserves, and rupee liquidity. Known for his significant contributions to financial market regulations to the RBI, he also served as a whole time board member of SEBI from 2016 to 2021. Mr. Malingam will share his insights on the theme, understanding the legal and regulatory landscape, key considerations for independent directors. Please welcome Mr. G. Malingam. Thank you so much. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Julie. Uh, am I clearly audible and visible? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be addressing this elite audience. Uh, first of all, let me actually congratulate the president of the Institute of Directors for having given a wonderful introduction covering the entire topic of independent directors. I mean, he has not really left anything for me to speak on. He has really covered a vast gamut in those small 10, the short 10 minutes. My job here is to basically focus on, since I come from SEBI, since I am from the Securities and Exchange Board of India, what are the expectations of SEBI from the independent directors? That's what I'm going to focus on. I'll be available for questions at the back end of the session. That's what I thought the structure would be because let the other panelists would uh, let them also go through that thought process. Then finally, we will have the Q&A where I'll be present to answer the questions. Clearly, I think that this audience consists of a variety of independent directors. Some are new, some are old, some are in manufacturing industries, some are in service industries, some are in financial sector. So the kind of domain expertise that we are talking about here is not going to be homogeneous at all. But then that's not what we are concerned here with. As the president said, Lieutenant General Nath, I think we are talking about overall the generic role of the independent director. What are they expected to fulfill? First, let me start off with a warning. Clearly, this is a very difficult role. It's not an easy role at all. Why? Why do I say that? You are trying to balance between the promoter's interests or the management interests on the one hand, and on the other hand, you are going to be voicing the concerns of the minority shareholders. So this is where the balance is going to be very important. The trade-off is going to be very important. As an independent director, SEBI looks at your role as the voice of the minority shareholders. Now, I'm not trying to say that you need to pick a quarrel with the promoters. You need to pick a quarrel every time with the management. No, that's not your role at all. But then what you are looked at from the SEBI's perspective is that you are going to pose a constructive challenge to the management. Now, when I use the word constructive challenge, Clearly, I am meaning constructive. I am not trying to use the word obstructionist. You are not trying to stop any of the discussions. You are not interested in the company moving backward or stopping in its progress. All that you are interested in it, if the management is coming out with a strategy, if the management is trying to come up with a proposal, you are looking at all sides of the proposal from the risk perspective, from the minority stakeholders' perspective, from the other stakeholders' perspective, 
as to how good is this in the medium to long run for the company. We are not talking about the short run at all. Again, let me clearly say, we are not looking at the next quarter. While generally the corporate world today lives from quarter to quarter, which is the saddest part of it actually. What we are looking at is a medium to long term horizon, three years, five years, 10 years, whether the company would be able to come up with a meaningful strategy, whether the company would be able to really put up a good competition, would be able to garner a good amount of market share. In all this, the independent directors have a lot to contribute. I need not emphasize here, while the company may be garnering a huge amount of market share, while the company may be making a good amount of profits, is the company fulfilling social responsibility and the social objectives? This has become a special focus area these days. ESG. We are talking about environmental, social and the governance aspects. Is the company actually well equipped on these aspects that overall it will be able to sustain itself over the medium to long term? Because ultimately it has been realized the corporate landscape. It's not the short term profits which matter. It's a long term sustenance of the company which matters. And the long term sustenance of the company, sustainability of the entire business operations, it rests on how good, how well the company is actually positioned towards the society, positioned towards contributing to the society. Here again, the independent directors have a lot to contribute. I would also like to say in the present milieu, where we do find a lot of diversion of funds, a lot of frauds, financial frauds taking place, the independent directors again shoulder an onerous responsibility, <clears throat> which means they should be able to scrutinize the balance sheet, scrutinize the profit and loss account, scrutinize the cash flow statement very carefully when these are put up towards the end of the quarter, end of the year. And you should be able to understand them, ask meaningful questions as President Lieutenant General Surindranath said. So one important point that we could take from what Lieutenant General said was that the independent directors are not going to be shy of asking questions. You can never be shy of asking questions. You may be branded as a person who is not aware of this industry. You are asking questions which are absolutely novice kind of questions. I would say coming from SEBI, it doesn't matter if you get that brand. As long as the answers that you elicit from the management, if they satisfy you, fine, you can go to the next question, you can go to the next agenda item. If they don't satisfy you, your job is to stop there and ask the management for satisfactory answers. If they are not able to come up with a satisfactory answer, give them time till the next meeting. Let them come up with satisfactory answers. Your perseverance is going to count. Your actually steadfastness. If you think that the company is crossing the line of ethics, you are supposed to stand up and ask questions. If you think that the company is not on the right side of the investors, right side of the stakeholders, you are supposed to stand up and ask questions. So this is where again the role becomes pretty difficult. You are not only a director on the board of the company, you are actually an umpire in a cricket match. You are going to judge the management's ethical conduct. If there is something that you spot in the ethical conduct of the company as not comforting to you, Clearly, you will be the first person to raise the question. Today, the other important problem that is affecting the corporate landscape in India is the related party transactions. The related party transactions, people, the companies have a complex web, complex layers of companies above them, companies below them. There are several transactions which are done. And the chief financial officer will come and explain to you saying that this is a very uh, transaction in a normal course. It's your job to find out with whom are they are transacting and what are they transacting for. Particularly when you sit in the audit committee, when the related party transactions are put up to you, 
it's going to be your responsibility to find out how well these related party transactions align themselves with the market rates, market prices. That's what we call it as arm's length related party transactions. So the independent director is going to wield enormous influence in trying to evaluate each and every related party transaction, convince himself or herself that the transactions are in the best interest of the company. Interest of the company is, is not getting sacrificed, not getting compromised. So this is a very important role that the independent director would have to focus on. Again, president of IOD talked about technology. In every company today, technology plays a very important role. Technology obsolescence is a very common feature. Technology upgradation is a regular proposal which comes to the board. How well are we equipped as independent directors to judge those proposals? Is the technology, new technology, good for the company? Is it cost effective? Is it being employed by the competitors? Is it something whether the other, the other jurisdictions are practicing? What are the downtimes and failure rates of the technology? All these are very common sense oriented questions. You don't need to be a technology specialist to ask these questions. But we need to ask these questions because every company today has a huge amount of technology budget and the technology budget gets passed without too much of a discussion at all because not too many people understand technology. The point that Sebi would like to stress is you need not be a technology specialist, but you need to have a hawk eye over what is the technology meant for. You need to be convinced that that technology which is being brought in is going to be good for the company, is going to be cost effective, is going to sustain in the long run. It doesn't have too much of a downtime. All these things you need to ensure. So clearly when you talk about the governance role of an independent director, the governance role does not pertain to just the company's operations in the board or the committees and all that. It transcends over every aspect of the company, including technology, which is going to be pretty, pretty important in the days which are going to come. Lastly, before I close, quickly let me run through the kind of expectation that SEBI has from the independent directors. And then I definitely I will answer the questions towards the high end. I'm going to give you some simple principles. Strive to attend all the meetings. It may be difficult, but please attend all the meetings. If you are not able to attend the meetings, at least go through the agenda papers. And then if there are some agenda papers which are not convincing to you, please ask the management for clarification. And if you think that there is something which is very important and that's being rushed through, you have every right, you are well within your rights, to ask for further questions on those agenda papers. Voice your views very firmly. Report your concerns. The company is expected to take note of, record your concerns. If the concerns are not finding a place in the minutes, you have every right to ask for redrafting of the minutes that particular paragraph, that particular sentence, so that your concerns actually find very accurate description, accurate reflection is there of the concerns expressed by you. As I already mentioned, apply a lot of due diligence in scrutiny of financial statements. If you are going to come and say, if you are going to say that I'm not a finance specialist, I have nothing to do with finance. I am sitting in this company as an independent director because my domain expertise is something else. This is not going to wash tomorrow if the company is getting going to get into a financial fraud after having put it up to the board and the board passed the papers and you found that there is a financial fraud, the entire board is going to be show cause by SEBI. So again, let me actually tell you you don't need to be a chartered accountant. You don't need to be a cost accountant. You don't need to be a company secretary. All that you need to have is sound common sense to understand the balance sheet. That's absolutely essential. Take active part in formulating strategies. Any major decisions independent directors would have to be a part of. 
the company's manage management cannot take the independent de major decisions. Disclosures, wherever they are warranted, the company should be putting out in the public domain. Because today, insider trading is a very big problem which is afflicting the corporate landscape. So the independent directors would have to have a hawk side on the disclosures that is that a disclosure mechanism that the company practices. Overall, to end the entire address, I would like to say that you should be very conscious about the flow of information which comes to the board, whether the information is timely, whether the information is adequate, whether the information is accurate. All these, I mean, I have said in a few sentences, but as President said, I think this is something which you develop over a period of time after understanding the company. So if you ask me one last uh, thing, if the company is something which is not bringing the information to me, how do I tackle it? Well, if the information doesn't come to you in the board, you are not responsible for it at all. No liability will stick to you. Only if the information is going to pass through or there is a concern taken from you for a particular decision, you become accountable. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Hallingham, for your insightful address. And there, what stood out for me as a uh, somebody that's not a, on the Institute was the power of asking questions. Questions are the answers, and especially when it's around technology as well. So next, we have our keynote speaker, Dr. Ashish Makija, attorney of a managing attorney at AMC Law Firm and a World Bank trained corporate trainer. Dr. Hachis is a prominent expert in expert insolvency and corporate law, serving as a managing attorney of AMC Law Firm. He has extensive experience in corporate litigation, advisory and insolvency matters, and served as the counsel for the official liquidator at the High Court of Delhi for six years. Dr. Mahikta is a World Trade Bank corporate trainer, a sought after speaker on topics such as corporate governance, Forensic Audit and the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. He is our Principal of Faculty at IOD. He holds an adjunct faculty position at the Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs and has been an adjunct professor at Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson School of Law. Dr. Makija has authored 14 books on insolvency, bankruptcy and corporate law. He has significant board experience having served as an independent director for various companies, including the Shipping Corporation of India Limited and Caterpillar India Limited. Dr. Makija will share with us the top five things to consider while joining a board today as an independent director. Please welcome Dr. Ashish. Thank you, Dr. Ashish. Thank you, Judy. I think a uh, very good afternoon to all the participants here. Uh, I think it's a, it's a matter of sh sheer delight that you are part of the first series of the uh, webinar on uh, uh, the, the for the corporate for the board uh, members and particularly on due diligence of the independent directors friends let me start by saying and i i must appreciate uh, the the efforts of the iod and also what mr uh, mahalingam and also the president uh, lieutenant general surendranath mentioned the point they, they emphasized is that the greater responsibility lies on the shoulders of the independent directors. You cannot get away with that responsibility. But I must uh, remind my audience that besides SEBI, Mr. Mahalingam typically spoke about SEBI's responsibility because that was particularly his topic. But besides SEBI, my friends would also do good if they are having a great knowledge and updation about the Companies Act of 2013, which typically becomes the base of joining the board. So sometimes, uh, uh, practically prior to Companies Act 2013, some of the regulations, some of the guidelines were at variance, they were inconsistent. So people always ask me, which one to follow? A very simple formula, the strictest one is to be followed. You have to follow both, that which one is the strictest one, you need to follow that. Now, friends, before joining the board, there are certain things which are required. So I have to speak about top five things. The It is definitely an honor to become a part of any board member, but it 
comes with a significant responsibility, whether it is a non-profit organization, whether it is a startup, whether it is a major corporation, the role of the board is absolutely crucial in shaping the company's future. And as uh, uh, both of both both my predecessors, uh, Lieutenant General Surinder Nath and also Mr. Mahalingam, both emphasized that the 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 importance of significance of asking questions. Well, I will rephrase in in another manner that silence is out of window. Even if you are attending the board meeting and if you feel that certain resolution is being passed. Not only you have to ask questions, the point is you cannot remain silent. So silence is out of the window because it can entail a lot of responsibility. Now, coming back to the subject of the five top things to consider while joining the board. Friends, I've got a small presentation to share. So just give me some time. I'll just share that presentation with you and uh, it will become more interesting. Okay, let me see why I'm not able to share it. Just give me a moment. Okay, I hope uh, now it is visible. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the five things, uh, top five things to consider before joining the board, let me give you a small acronym to remember. A trustworthy leader balances risks. Just remember this. This is not a quote. This is not a statement, friends. What does it say? I, now I will take, this is just you have to remember. I will take the first letter of each word and expand on it. So a trustworthy leader balances risks. So this is what exactly the five top things which are required, which are required to be considered. So here A stands for alignment with personal and professional goals. That is only a way of remembering it. A trustworthy leader balances risks. Now, before joining the board, it is typically essential to reflect how the role aligns with your personal ethos and also your career aspirations. Mission and values of an organization, whether they resonate with you, serving on the board will be more fulfilling if you are passionate about the organization's goal. So it is extremely important. Professional growth, everyone looks for that professional growth. Will this role help you in developing new skills, or expanding your knowledge in a particular sector. Now consider whether the board position will provide networking opportunities and also enhance your professional profile. And lastly, the third point within this is ethical standards. I think the role of code of ethics cannot be undermined. We have to ensure that organizations, ethical standards and practices align with your own uh, practices also. And this is also crucial for your reputation and also for satisfaction. The second part, I think, which the second, uh, the, the letter, the T, the second uh, thing is T, which is which stands for time commitment. I think Mr. Mahalingam said it, if possible, attend all board meetings because the significant time is required for, for uh, while you are on the board. How often does the board meet? What are their expectations of the attendance? I think it is very important. And my friends will remember that in the board of directors report of the listed companies, the how many meetings every board member has attended is also mentioned. So out of six meetings or 10 meetings, if you have attended zero, then it will reflect upon your own reputation. And then, of course, friends, not only the attendance of the time, uh, attendance of the board meetings time is required, there is a preparation time. The board members often spend time outside the meetings, reviewing papers, preparing for discussions and participating in committees. You will may, you will, you may be a part of a lot of committees. So long-term commitment is required because typically any board position will last multiple years. So you must make sure whether you are ready to commit for that duration of that term. And third, friends, the third point is L, which stands for legal duties and responsibilities. Let me let me take you to the legal duties. Now, the first one is the duty of care. The uh, care here means that you have to work in the best interest of the company. Due diligence, skill, and care is definitely required. And then, if you are you have to avoid the personal and professional conflict of interest, avoiding and in fact, the role of an independent director is not only to avoid, but also to resolve the conflict of interest. 
And the third duty is the financial oversight. The board members often see financial policies, the approved budgets, and they also ensure that the funds of the uh, corporate of the company are used properly to meet their goals. And then, of course, uh, you may be there may be a slight conflict of interest because you might have been nominated by somebody. You might be a nominee of, uh, say, a parent company or a bank. Now, the point is whether you have to act in the interest of that nominator or you have to act in the interest of the company. The answer is that you have to be loyal to that company. You have to take decisions in the best interest of that company. The fourth one, friends, stands for the board dynamics and culture. The effectiveness of the board, it greatly depends upon its internal culture. The communication style, look for the board that values clear, transparent, and respectful communication. The decision making, does the board encourage diverse viewpoints and make decisions collaboratively? So these are very important aspects, friends, which you need to consider. And then, of course, the leadership style. The leadership style of every company may differ. So you need to adapt yourself to that leadership style. It is not that you have to confront all the time, as Mr. Mahalingam also mentioned, that you don't have to question. You don't have to be in a, in a fighting mode. Naturally, you will pose a question. But you have you can always be respectful for that. So consider the leadership style of the board chair and the dynamics between the board members. A supportive and a strategic leader can significantly enhance the board's effectiveness. And friends, the last point which I want to mention about here is the risks and liabilities. This position on the board, my dear friends, does not come without risks. You have to really you see, consider those risks, you must know what you are getting into. Awareness of the risk is extremely important so that you can take an informed decision. So what are the risks which are involved? Reputational risks. Now, your professional reputation could be influenced by the actions and reputation of the organization. Supposing you are a part of a company and there is a scam which occurs, naturally, it will also affect your reputation. Financial stability. You need to understand the financial health of the organization to avoid any kind of surprises. This includes reviewing of the financial statements and audit results. As Mr. Mahalinga mentioned, you need not be an expert in finance, but you must have the basic knowledge of how to read financial statements. And then, friends, the last point is the legal liabilities. Friends, let me, let me mention this that non-compliance of provisions of the Companies Act 2013, it entails criminal liability. And if a complaint is filed by the registrar of companies before the board, what is the first thing which is required to be done by the board member? If, if they are also named in that, they have to obtain bail. Now, I'm not scaring you. I'm simply saying that, look, it entails a lot of liabilities there are legal liabilities can come in and no insurance will protect it. There, can, there, is a, there is a liability insurance, directors and officers liability insurance concept is also there. But friends, please remember, it will cover only your civil liability. And if you are a board member, friends, you will really do well if you are able to go through the, the provisions of the Companies Act, particularly Section 447. Because in section 447, there is a new definition which talks about the, the fraud. The fraud has been defined. And every section, whichever imposes a responsibility, it refers that the director will be responsible for the fraud. So therefore, friends, it, is, it becomes very important that the informed decision must be taken by the, the a person concerned before accepting the assignment. And of course, this due diligence will continue. It is not that once you have become a board member, it will stop there. It needs, it will continue for till the time you remain there and you will have to change gears at times. So friends, I'll just stop here. Thank you so much for giving me time. Uh, and of course, as far as the questions are concerned, we will definitely uh, uh, take it up at the end uh, after the panel, uh, uh, you see, distinguished panelists have also spoken about it. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Makija. A trustworthy leader balances risks. That's a great acronym. Even I can remember that one. It's beautiful. And we'd like you to stay on, actually, because you're going to be moderating the next um, panel, our next panel session, which will focus on the due diligence checklist for independent directors. Um, we have a great lineup of speakers, and I'm hoping I get the names pronunciation correct. <laughs> I get a special prize if I do who will share their practical step, boardroom resources, case studies, and experiences. So please welcoming joining our speakers. Our first one is Mr. S. Sananthanan Krishnan. Call me SK. Call me SK. SK. <laughs> Let me make I like that. Simpler. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. What a blessing. SK, Thank I you. got that one right. Big high five. Thank it's you. an independent director on several boards, including IC, uh, ICICI, Home Finance, and PKF Preserve. With over 40 years, and he's only 50, over 40 years of expertise in accounting, finance, strategy, and planning. He's a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, managing partner at PKF Sridhar and Sanantham LLP. He served on the ICI AI Central Council for 15 years. When did you sleep? <laughs> and he's also our principal faculty at IOD. He's involved with various government bodies and industry bodies, including a high level commitment on CSR as a government nominee on the Central Council of the Institute of Company Secretaries of India. Welcome, SK. Much Thank easier you. for me. <laughs> and second, all the way on the East Coast, I'd like to welcome Ms. Vijaya Sampath. I can get that one right is a lawyer with over 35 years of experience and serves as an independent director on the boards of various companies in sectors like housing, finance, renewable energy, and power. She's the ombudsman person for the Bharti Group and was previously a partner at J. Sagar Associates and Global Group General Counsel for Bharti Airtel. Ms. Sam Fellow, member of the Institute of Company Securities of India. She chairs FICCI's Corporate Law Committee and engages with industry on company law and policy. Next in the lineup, and this is a real humdinger of a name, Mr. CHSS Malik R. Junero. Is that how is that? Call me Rao. Rao, okay. Yeah. I'll call you Rao. <laughs> Yeah, that helps good. me a lot. He's <laughs> yes. an independent director on several boards, including Axis Bank Limited and Indian Financial Technology and Allied Services, with over 37 years of banking experience. He began his career as a probationary officer of the Bank of Marasarata and served as managing director and CEO of Punjab National Bank until January 2022 overseeing the successful amalgamation of Oriental Bank of Commerce and United Bank of India. Before PMB, he was MD and CEO of Alabad Bank and Executive Director of Syndicate Bank. Welcome. And finally, our fourth palace, uh, um, panel speaker, Ms. Shumita Gatak, has 30 years of professional experience with over 16 years in a leadership role, including MD, and CEO and former ED and PU at ISRA Analytics Limited, a subsidiary. She is also our principal at the faculty of IOD. She has expertise in governance and has managed diverse business um, businesses of management consulting, analytical offshoring services, risk managed solutions, fixed income research, and tech enabled products and solutions in investment analytics. What an incredible panel you have today. And I'd like to now hand over to the amazing Dr. Ajit to moderate this exponential, right. beautiful thank, panel. Thank you, Julie. Uh, yes, I agree with you. I think we have a very distinguished panelist who are here now. Uh, friends, uh, this session is promises to be very engaging and insightful as we delve into the, the very important aspect of the uh, due diligence for independent directors. And uh, we are very fortunate also to have the four very distinguished panelists with uh, us who are experts in their own relevant field. So today's uh, this panel discussion will last approximately 30 minutes, including the Q&A at the end of the session. 
I encourage all the audiences to submit their uh, questions at any time during the discussion, particularly through the chat box. We will we'll unmute you at the time uh, when the Q&A session starts. And you can also, uh, we will we'll be able to uh, take your questions at that time. So uh, to kick things off, uh, I think I would like to start first uh, with uh, our uh, distinguished uh, panelist, Mr. S. Santana Krishnan. SK, as, as of course, uh, he mentioned that he would like to be called. Uh, the, the point what uh, I, want to, uh, I want you to deliberate is, what are your thoughts on the what kind of diligence is to be done based on your vast experience? Here, the, the uh, audience would like to know, as far as, your, as far as your experience goes, what due diligence should be taken up? Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. First, uh, you're the first person who mentioned my name very clearly. Uh, so you didn't need an abbreviation. Thank you very much. And also, I've uh, truly enjoyed doing an IODI. Uh, Mr. Surindranath has uh, really given a good introduction. Also enjoyed uh, when I talk after Mr. Malingam, because I always have one or two points against the regulator <laughs> to talk about. Therefore, uh, Mr. Malingam brings out all the points so well. It's such an enjoyable Time to uh, time to listen to him, but I've always had the fortune of uh, talking after him, Mahalingam. So this time also is no exception to me. I think uh, from a viewpoint of a uh, my own belief, uh, I've had uh, uh, boards for the last twenty five years. Probably I would have shared the first as a chairman as a most difficult situation of having to remove Cyrus Mystery against Tata. I mean, if you ask me, we balanced it so well that uh, no one could complain. The Supreme Court uh, upheld what we did. I'm talking about the first board which removed him. There are boards which did not remove him. But I was the first one who started, and there was a reason for it. Now, I would say that uh, while holding an independent director's post is a little tough and difficult, but there are methods in which that the independent director should uh, stay vigilant and do a due diligence. First, no board organizes the agenda in an ABC analysis. The biggest problem that the independent directors today face is agendas are not organized. If the management wants to take you for a ride, genuinely or not genuinely, they can put the smallest item of 1,000 rupees fraud in the beginning I've uh, chaired two banks. You, you will get 1,000 rupee fraud at the beginning. You'll endlessly discuss. And at about, uh, as you break for lunch and the board meeting is due, they will come up with a fraud of 100 crores. And you don't have time to discuss it. Therefore, doing an ABC analysis and segregating A items first and then concentrating on A items by the board members would be one of the best ways in which you can be vigilant and you continue to have due diligence on the board. I'm saying due diligence is not only at the time of joining, it also, also continues during your lifetime in the board. Therefore, due diligence is part of your life. The second, I'm not sure how many of you would have uh, really uh, talked about, uh, 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 Mr. Maling also talked about related party transactions. I'm not able to understand. I don't know how many of you would have asked for the related party to certify first. In his opinion, this transaction is not making undue profit. In his opinion, it is fair and proper and is the best interest of the company. I don't think you can appoint consultants, ask them to give you a report. You will ever understand a consultant's report. You can only say I'm protected, I can go home and sleep well, but you wouldn't have discharged your responsibility well. You should, uh, that's why I always insist that the related party should be asked to vote on the transaction. It's a mistake on the part of SEBI not asking related parties to participate. The, uh, uh, I'll take an example. I have to chromium plate my uh, mudguard in a car. The related party will stay outside. It's he who knows everything. Independent directors will sit in half an hour and decide and then become accountable. Therefore, related party transactions, due diligence is first ask the a uh, related party to confirm and certify that he is not making super profit. One more thing Mr. Mahalingam said about, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm sharing all this, which might not have been uh, the practice. 
Uh, Ms. Malingam certainly mentioned about chartered accountant and your financial literacy, etc. But there's one document which you don't have to be financially literate. No one reads it. The most dangerous, most important is a cash flow statement. How have you ever read the cash flow statement? For cash flow statement, you don't have to be a financial expert. You go through the cash flow statement, companies' borrowings are going up. Companies' debtors are going up. Companies' inventories are going up. Fundamental. <laughs> you will be able to appreciate and you will be able to understand that if there is a problem in the cash flow, then question them. I have always taken the view that an independent director need not know relevant answers. But the independent director should ask relevant questions. You should not be under the impression that you need to know the answers uh, before you ask the question. In fact, you are not supposed to know the answer. You are only supposed to ask relevant questions. In a boardroom, there is an asymmetry of information. One side knows everything, the other side knows little, and the other side takes a responsibility for whatever it does. Therefore, your being prepared is very important. Uh, Chairman, do I have two more minutes? Sorry, I have, time is inadequate. Yes, uh, yes. Sorry. You, you can take say, two more minutes. Two more minutes, okay. Yeah. The other one is, that uh, uh, invariably <laughs> in listed companies, they will say, I can't share the accounts with you because it is listed. Share prices will go up and down. Uh, there could be insider trading. The biggest joke that I've ever come across, if a management is going to say that, I will doubt the integrity of the management. I tell them, hold the board meeting on Monday evening or hold the board meeting on Saturday morning. Don't tell me a story that you will not give me the accounts because you don't have uh, you uh, you are a listed company S spend adequate time and the greatest thing that the technology has done is if you are embarrassed to ask questions very quietly sit in the boardroom send an email to them you don't have to embarrass anybody you you should innocuously send the email and saying this is the doubts can you please take it up your job stops. In fact, very easy for you to be independent as long as you take it that your job is not to change the course. Your job is to bring facts before them, tell them what your view is, then it is for the majority to take it up. It is not your problem to uh, uh, do this. Most importantly, with chat GPT and all other technologies that are coming up, your learning is going to be so, so simple. You go into chat GPT, and say, what is the interest calculation? What are the market practices? Probably, even as you sit in the boardroom, you are able to get it. Therefore, uh, and so for want of time, I'll limit with this. Very important for the directors to stay vigilant and continue to do due diligence. Watch out for the ethical and moral values of the management. If it changes, you'll have to be careful. Do an ABC analysis. Uh, do uh, what are the methods of uh, related party transaction like difficult areas. Find a method of overcoming it. Find, uh, re read your cash flow statements well and uh, use your technology very well. I think one man can make the difference. That is what has happened in the world. The Mahatma Gandhi got us freedom. Today, people talk about uh, 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 Modi. Uh, people, only the one man who makes a difference. That one man is an independent director. He will make a difference if you will be vigilant. And if you don't get unnecessarily perturbed at, uh, about your responsibilities and do it to the best of your ability. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Sanandhi Krishnan. I think I, I can say that you are practically speaking from your experience and the friends, what is the key takeaway? Watch out. Single person can also change the world. So now uh, moving on to uh, Ms. Vijaya Sampath. I think she is she has joined us from the US at a very unearthly time. Of course, it's, it's in the morning now. And I was also in the East Coast uh, just four, five days back. So I, I can understand when a seminar happens at 3 p.m. in India. So what, what it takes to get up and, and be ready for the seminar. Uh, Ma'am, how does your experience align with or differ with what we have just heard from Mr. Sanandan Kishan on due diligence? Okay, I, I will try to cover. Good day to all of you, first of all. Thank to the panelists, to uh, all the participants. Uh, what I will try to do over the next five minutes, and I request uh, Dr. Makija to let me know when my five minutes is up so that I don't impinge on other people's time. Sure. Is, uh, you know, 
I think there are two things to be done. You know, look at it from two aspects. One is what do you do before you join a board? What is the due diligence? And that's very, very important. Because once you've gotten to the board, it's not very easy to get out unless there is a possible reason for you to do so. So a lot of due diligence has to be done before you join the board. And during the time you join the board, there's a lot of due diligence to be done. And even after you leave, then you don't have to do due diligence, but you need to keep an eye on what's happening in the board after your tenure has ended. Because there's something called the DNO. I understand that you can't be responsible, that it can't pay for the frauds, but you still need to keep an eye. So due diligence before you join the board is, what is the sector? What is the current status of the sector? Is it a sunrise sector? Sun is doing well? Are the, is it a regulated sector? So the sector, you need to understand very well. Of course, the company, but in addition, you need to understand what the sector is doing. What are the other listed companies? Who are your competitors? Please do a study on them. Understand how they are performing. What does their board look like? What does their management look like? What are they doing? How are they performing? How are they operating? Three promoters. And this is very important because all Indian companies or most of the Indian listed companies, almost all of them, have promoters. So are they first generation promoters? What is the involvement level of the second generation? What is the reputation of the promoters? You just have to do ask and find out. There's a lot of information available and you need to find out this. Why do they want you on the board? That's very important. You need to ask the promoters. Why is it that especially if you don't know them and none of the boards that I knew that uh, knew me before I joined. I didn't know the promoters and they did not know me. So why do they want you on the board? Why is it? Uh, then meet them in the office because that gives you a lot of clues. Don't try and meet them in a hotel or any other business center or any other place. Meet them in the office because you get a lot of clues when you go into an office and see the culture of the company. You can see even if you spend half an hour, one hour with them in the office, please do that. What are the other executive directors? That's the fourth one. What is their background? Are they professional or are they other related parties? I'm not talking direct related parties, but you have something known as indirect related parties. And I'm sure all of us know what is that. Okay, related parties are those which few are specified, but you do have people who are outside or other related parties. How long have they been in office? What is the organization structure of the company and how does power emanate to them? Last one is other independent directors. And this is the most important. You do need to meet with all of them together with them separately, what is their background? What is their profession? Ask questions. Before, ask, you know, everyone has been talking about asking questions, but please do ask the questions before you join the board. Ask them about meetings, governance, how long does it take, what are the agenda, how does it relate, the auditors. So whatever questions we need to ask, and also it gives you a feeling when you meet the other independent directors, can we get along with them? Because board dynamics, Dr. Makija mentioned that, very important to understand. Do we, are we able to, uh, am I as a person, will I be able to get along with them? I know you can't judge and, you know, get all the answers, but at least these are the five topics that you need to do. Five, uh, I would say due diligence matters that you need to do before you join a board and think a lot before you do that. Because uh, joining a board is, you know, a very, a, a very difficult task. It's not easy and you need to understand. Then once you join the board, what are the red flags that you need to look at? Delayed financial reporting. I don't get my results in time. Some results, and we all know the stories of, you know, delayed financial reporting and what happens. That's one. Two, frequent changes in the auditor, the CFO, the internal auditor, or the CXO. Somebody keeps changing all the time. These are all red flags. I'm not saying that every red flag means that there is a problem, but these are things that you need to ask more questions when these things happen. Persistent negative cash flow. Dr. Santana, Mr. Santana Krishnan explained about negative cash flow. I mean, cash flows. Negative cash flow. Persistent negative cash flows. It means the company is not operating in a manner that it should be doing. You can have negative cash flows for some time when you go in for you know a huge amount of debt when you do a large project. But consistent negative cash flows, a big red flag. Poor performing subsidiaries, and many of them have so many subsidiaries. Uh, so what what we call step down subsidiaries. Frequent infusions of equity and debt into these subsidiaries is a very, very big red flag. You need to understand why is this company having so many subsidiaries? Maybe a reason, good reason, need to ask. Why are we keep on putting money into this company? Whether as equity, whether as debt, they are not able to pay their interest. What sort of, so a lot of diligence needs to be done when you are on a board on the subsidiaries as well. Just because you're on the main board cannot afford to uh, ignore subsidiaries. The large ones, of course, are more important than the small ones. And if a company has about 30, then you need to understand that at least you need to keep it all, you know, and do an ABC analysis and keep an eye on the la larger ones. But very important, why is the company or the holding company in which you are a director 
all the time spending money on putting money into equity and debt in the company aggressive right. accounting practices how they recognize debt uh, financial ratios exceeding work come yes please yeah ma'am may i just request you to please conclude yeah yeah i'm concluding on that uh, financial ratios huge variance between the peers and differences high dividend payout ratio especially when the promoters have a high stake very high debt levels and last two years budget versus actual variance high and keep an eye on the ratios the large ratios gross margin operating margin net margin current ratio debt equity ratio debt service coverage ratio there are seven or eight ratios i won't mention the details but you need to keep an eye on them because if they exceed the financial covenants then sometimes you can get into default with banks thank you thank you uh, vijay ma'am i think uh, she has actually uh, elaborated what are the points which you have to uh, take care of it and i was also mesmerized in fact i also lost the time uh, I, I, I is, and then i when i looked at my watch i said oh five minutes are over <laughs> so, i'm sorry i'm sorry i didn't want to no, exceed no, no problems yeah so now uh, i think i will move on to uh, mr malik arjuna rao his vast experience as a banker on the other side and now of course he has looked it from from a, from the top of the tree how the companies function and now he's a part of those companies uh, sir would you like to expand on uh, this discussion or what we are what we are having about due diligence how you perceive as per your experience as a banker and then of course as a board member yeah good afternoon to all of you uh, it has been really a wonderful opportunity for me to share my views and uh, the eminent speakers have already spelled out a wonderful points with respect to how the due diligence is to be taken care in terms of uh, taking up an assignment as an independent director i would like to continue on uh, what madam sampath madam vijaya has told very aptly that when you are uh, when you get an opportunity to become independent director of any organization it is very important for us to understand the know your company first unless you know what is that company like madam has said very relevantly what kind of a sector it is what kind of business they are undertaking who are the promoters and what kind of top management is there so without sounding to be repetitive what i would like to continue to say is that how relevant i am to be the independent director on such a company where whether the value addition could be there if the value addition is not going to be there and whether my expertise doesn't fit in then would i be taking a call to be part of that company there could be various other opportunities one important thing is not only that knowing the company where you are going to take up the assignment and how you are going to look at yourself that your expertise would be useful for the company when you become part of the uh, vertical company as an independent director another important thing what i would like to uh, i would like to look at is the regulator pers regulator's perspective on the company's functioning we have got a lot of uh, vertical different sets of heterogeneous companies like financial sector is there there are other companies which are in the manufacturing sector which are in the services sector so every majority of the companies are governed by sebi and there are financial sector which are governed by the reserve bank of india additionally in if there are banks which are given license under the schedule now the important thing is if there is a regulator already available other than this sebi the what is the oversight of a regulator with respect to the governance there is a lot of data available in the public domain even you can go to the website of the particular company and understand what what are the financial reports which are coming out whether the financial reports cover the observations given by the auditors by them through notes on accounts or even matter of emphasis or otherwise then you will more effectively understand the organization how the corporate governance is being spelled out or played out in the organization next uh, the important point what madam said is yes interaction with the former directors or even existing directors will give a little more impetus for you to understand before you take up the assignment now having discussed about the uh, uh, what is the point where if i get an opportunity to take up the position of independent director now being part of the director already when you are functioning how you are going to contribute in terms of ensuring that the effective governance is there without uh, what is called uh, getting an impact on your roles and responsibilities number 1 every company i am sure will have a charter specifically meant as to how the agendas are going to be discussed what kind of agendas are going to come up either at the board level or committee level as you are all aware the important committees are risk management committee and audit committee of the board and if that company has a it committee that is also very important now how these committees charters are defined by the board so that that will be a guiding principle how whether the agendas are being put up to you now like uh, uh, what is called dr makija and even dr mahalingam are telling 
time commitment is very very critical you 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 can't think it is a post retirement assignment for you it is an assignment where you have to put your time there are no shortcuts in going through the agenda in case you feel the quantum of agenda or the uh, what do you call the agenda size in terms of the pages is very high you can always request the company to provide you a executive uh, what do you call summary but brevity of the information should not be at the cost of clarity in terms of the agenda based on which you are going to take the decision so very important factor is when you are already functioning as an independent director you have every right to see that agendas are properly put up to you and there is a charter which is defined very clearly for the board and the committees and you are looking at that uh, like they have indicated uh, with respect to questioning what you need that is the minimum thing you could do there is no question of any hesitancy in terms of putting forth your questions rightly said whether you know the answer or not you need to put the relevant questions to get the answer to the level of your satisfaction ensuring corporate governance is very very critical and today you see because of the uh, issues which are cropping up in the governance of various companies sebi is also very particular about the responsibilities of independent directors in protecting the interest of minority shareholders and also guiding the company to move in the proper direction understanding the regulatory observations and timelines for rectification is very very critical just like having an understanding of observation doesn't make a clear uh, what you call conclusion of it unless it is rectified by the management and the board will always have a very clear oversight to see whether the regulatory uh, what you call uh, observations are properly taken care the simple fact is rules of the game are importantly to be known before anybody wants to do the business in the name of business rules of the game cannot be overlooked or overstepped and the rules of the game are very clearly defined by the sebi through the companies act and also by other regulators whether it is rbi or irda or any other regulator applicable for the uh, what you call company so i would like to uh, what you call reiterate the uh, what you call points that when you are taking up an assignment be clear on understanding the company be clear whether you are relevant when you become part of the uh, what you call as an independent director the, when i say relevant you were expertise being useful you were capability to grasp the business activities of the particular company it is better to choose the one where it matches your expertise and where you can contribute more effectively rather than going to a company where completely it is out of your out of sync with respect to your grasp second when you are already part of the uh, what is your company as an independent director do not hesitate to understand effectively by questioning them even in uh, in some of the companies i have seen when you become part of the director as an independent director initially they undertake a uh, what is the induction exercise they would like to give you completely the overview of the company based on which over a period of time in a matter of a month or two or three you will understand more effectively and you will be able to play your role more effectively thank you great sir thank you so much uh, and uh, i think the key takeaway was as from the banking point of view we call it as know your customer so he has extended to to the corporate world know your company i think that's that's fantastic because if you don't file kyc in a bank you are you also get a credit freeze not only a debit freeze you also get a credit freeze so yeah, that's what it's it's extremely important and he also mentioned uh, the the importance of going on a public domain as as mr santana krishna also mentioned chat gpt so therefore public domain and google is our best friend i think that is what we can say okay now i will go on to another distinguished uh, panelist uh, sushmita ghatak ji uh, ma'am can you share your insights on on due diligence of course the earlier speakers have already spoken but based on your experience what are your insights on due diligence sure um good afternoon everybody so i i think i'll go the way vijay explained it that there are three parts to it one is before you join a board uh, while you're in the board and after you leave a board so before you join a board quite a few things have been spoken um to add a few uh, when we look at financials also have a look at the credit rating to see how things have moved if there has been a steep deterioration in the credit rating of a company and these credit ratings are easily available on the websites of the of, of the cra agencies the other very really important source of information today are the brsr reports especially for listed companies and they give a wealth of information um look for you know fines penalties that may have been paid 
Analogous to credit rating, uh, ESG ratings are also available in the public space. Uh, companies like MSCI, companies like Sustainalytics, they put them out on their website. Do have a look at the ESG ratings also. Uh, Mr. Mahalingam was talking at the beginning in terms of the social commitment, etc., to the other, the three pillars of ESNG. So those would be kind of, you know, good things to look at. Uh, so moving from a due, I mean, from the financial and the non-financial data, I come to something called promoter pledges. And promoter pledges are something that a promoter, uh, there are various ways for an organization to raise money. And one of the ways is for the promoter uh, to pledge his shares with a bank to raise capital. And this need not always be a bad thing. And just having, and, and this data is available on the BSC NSC uh, website in terms of corporate filings. Look at the percentage. And while I will shy away from giving what is the correct percentage, because there is really no number like that, uh, some uh, financial analysts would peg it at 15 to 20%. But anything on the higher range should definitely kind of make us wary. And that has to be seen along with the cash flow statement. So if there is a improved cash flow and a promoter pledge it's all right but maybe in other situations it's a red flag and the third would be please check for um, adverse meet news on the media and those today are very very easily available so so that would be prior to joining uh, while we are on the board uh, we have a lot of tools available with us through which we could ask for information so to each board uh, when an internal auditor is appointed, the scope of work comes to the board uh, for ratification. That is one important place to ask, where should the internal auditors be kind of focusing upon? Uh, since IDs really represent those people who do not have a seat at the table, the whistleblower mechanism is a very, very important thing for an ID to look at. And we need to be vigilant about asking for such kind of, you know, what has happened to the uh, the the those committee not the committee those analysis those investigations etc. Uh, the third is as a uh, board member one could potentially be members of three committees NRC audit committee and the CSR committee. If one is a member of the audit committee, SEBI expects us to be financially literate. So if any of us are a part of audit committee, we need to kind of, you know, even if we don't have financial background, it's uh, incumbent on us to kind of, you know, step up on that direction. For NRC, uh, we should not at all be kind of, you know, hesitant in asking for more and more data. Anything that helps us to understand how is the company making a decision. And if we are on the CSR committee, then asking for impact assessment is something that is kind of, you know, pretty important to understand how has the CSR money kind of, you know, been uh, deployed. And once we leave, uh, please, we have to ensure that the necessary DIR forms have been filed so that on the MCA website, after a month of your leaving, we need to kind of go and check the MCA website to see that our names kind of, you know, are no more kind of linked with the company. And Dr. Makhija, to end, I thought uh, it would be nice to quote from Dr. Irani's report, which had really kind of set the tone for this, that as an independent director, all that we need to do is get an element of objectivity to this entire board process. I think that's a very kind of simple thing that we're looking at, and that is that uh, particular element of objectivity that would help us to be classified as an independent director or as somebody has called us as gatekeepers of governance. And with that, I'll hand it over back to you, Dr. Makhija. Thank you. Thank you, Sushmita, ma'am. I think it's it's wonderful to hear from you. And particularly, yes, uh, Dr. Nani's report is a wonderful piece of document, which I think, I believe everyone must go through that once. All independent directors must go through that. Uh, friends, before we move on to the questions and answers, uh, I think I need to announce that there will be a poll. Uh, two questions will be posed. So I will request the uh, organizers to please put those polls and uh, 30 seconds will be allowed for the audience to uh, there is there is like four options are there. So you'll have to pick whatever uh, you want to be. Four or five options are there. So it will be a poll. Uh, two questions will be there. And after that, we will announce those results of that poll also. Uh, so in the meantime, while uh, audience also does that, we have uh, 
very important discussion which has taken place on the due diligence. Let me also emphasize from a legal perspective, from a legal point of view. Friends, whenever you join a board, you need to know about the company as, as uh, Mr. Malik Arjuna Rao also mentioned and all panelists uh, have been, have been oh, no, uh, you see, emphasizing about that aspect. Why I am also emphasizing is because we have to look at section 164, which talks about disqualifications. And it says that no person who has been or is a director of a company, that company has failed to file its balance sheets for a consecutive three years period or has failed to repay its public deposits or debentures, principal or interest for a period of one year, then such a director will not be able to act as a director, become a director in any other company for next three years. So friends, while you join such a company, which is a defaulting company, you cannot become a director because that disqualification gets attached to your label. So therefore, it is why one has to be very careful about doing due diligence about those companies. So before we uh, open the questions to the audience in a little while, uh, I have a few questions uh, for, for Sushmita, ma'am. I'll start with you. Uh, can you share some common pitfalls or the challenges the independent directors face while conducting due diligence? And how do you think that they will be they can be effectively overcome? I think one is around the asymmetry of information. So as an independent director, um, do we have kind of, you know, at, at times it's asymmetry of information and also maybe at times we ourselves are not kind of prudent enough to do the enough due diligence. So we have a promoter or a friend who knows us and approaches us and we are unable to kind of, you know, say no. And um, so those would be kind of not knowing where you are. It's, 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 it's like kind of, you know, going in for a job. So when we join a job, at times we're very euphoric that here I have got a great job in a great company and it seems all great from the outside and I don't do my due diligence. So I think that there is only one pitfall that you haven't kind of, you know, done your due diligence enough. Um, Vijaya did speak about speaking with uh, IDs. In today's situation, when we are all so kind of, you know, located in different places, Today, LinkedIn also serves as a good place. So whenever I have been approached, one of the first things I do is I go onto the website of the company, look at the names of the people. If I find that those people are not in boards of any companies, then it's very clear that the promoters have kind of put them there to kind of, you know, meet the requirements, the regulatory requirements. So, so basically kind of checking the profile of the independent directors itself uh, and the chairperson, if it's a non-executive chairperson, for me is kind of, you know, point number one. Um, the others can kind of, you know, uh, take a second seat, but but that's what it is, Dr. Makija. Okay, great. Uh, uh, I think now my next question would be to Mr. Malikarjana Rao. Uh, sir, everyone is emphasizing about the technology that plays a greater role. So uh, can you also suggest certain tools or platforms which you can recommend uh, which which the the independent directors should go to like maybe a SEBI's website could be one of the platforms which could be there. So can you suggest more to the independent directors? See, uh, technology is very critical. There's no doubt on that. And if, if you've seen in the uh, what the last twenty years or even fifteen years, technology has become uh, completely uh, uh, what call omnipresent in the entire uh, business activity, whether the financial sector or otherwise. And financial sector is more critical. Now, coming to suggesting to independent directors, acclimatizing of the technology is very important because you can't pinpointedly say a particular application or a particular platform will be useful. It, it differs from uh, what you call sector to sector. Suppose uh, I talk about a bank. There are predominantly three uh, what you call core banking technologies which are used. One is Infosys, another is TCS, and the third one is iFlex Solutions. So naturally, some element of understanding of these three. iFlex, I think it is taken over by now and uh, what you call the Oracle. So these are the three companies which are currently used. Similarly, if you look at other companies, it may not be the core banking, it could be ERP solutions, it could be SAP. There are various different applications. The fundamental point is the independent director should have capability to grasp how the technology is going to influence the business activity, how technology is going to influence the working per se of the entire company and how he, he can uh, what he can involve himself to understand. So there are guidance notes which are given by SEBI. There are guidance notes which are given by other regulators as well. Independent director has to 
understand and see how he can grasp rather than looking at a particular technology it is, it is not possible for somebody to understand technology in totality to the architecture mm-hmm. level but grasping as to what the technology delivers is very critical is is very critical yes yes sir i i i agree with you uh, mr malingam since uh, i think i was hearing your address very carefully sir based on your experience uh, in sebi and otherwise dealing with the companies uh, can you share some kind of red flags or the warning signs which independent directors should be aware of to assess a potential board situation yeah that's a pretty pretty important question well i think this has been dealt with extensively by other speakers but let me put it in my words i think clearly one thing mr santana krishnan alluded to was the asymmetry of information i think the flow of information the adequacy of information the completeness of information is the most important thing that we need to be wary of now it is something like a criminal case in a court where the judge is the only person who is ignorant all others present in the court are aware what the case is all about and it is unfortunately the judge who gives a verdict in the case so similarly here the independent director may not be aware of whatever the management is up to but he is going to be in a position to evaluate the answers which are given to him and then take take away from those answers as to what appeals to his common sense very much that is number 1 number 2 again this was flagged by one of the speakers the most important warning sign is about the kind of insider trading that could potentially take place in a company so here one has to be wary about the kind of material information which is shared not shared with the public domain where perhaps a management is in possession of the information so how is the independent director looking at the flow of information is the company maintaining a good structured database to track the flow of information so that tomorrow it doesn't become a real problematic issue this is the second important thing that i would like to highlight third this is again a very contentious issue is the managing director of the company becoming larger than life mm-hmm. that he or she is dominating over the board now this is something which is very practical it happens in a very successful company in a company which is actually continuously successful the managing director starts thinking that he or she is indispensable he is at he or she is more important than the board starts driving the board i think here the director will have to really stand up and mm. i'm not saying that you need to confront the managing director and cut her down to size cut him down to size i think you need to be very careful in dealing with such managing directors who really think that the company is they are the company and the company is them i think you have to be very careful i mean these are three things that i could list of course you could really list quite a few things i know <laughs> uh, so therefore the, the key takeaway is be assertive but yeah. of course naturally you have to be polite uh, now my my question to uh, vijaya ma'am is uh, what skills do you believe are essentials for future directors because skills are extremely important so what skills do you think that they are uh, necessary or essential for future directors Uh, ma'am you are muted actually we are not able to hear you okay i think uh, three skills i will keep it short one is uh, information technology and communication because the future with ai and the manner in which we are changing the whole world is changing it's very important to keep i can't say we can keep completely abreast of what's happening but to at least understand the implications of ai what it does to you what it cannot do and what are the dangers as well as the benefits of ai that's something very very important that we need to understand or uh, two is a uh, second one is financial literacy and i'll keep emphasizing that because it's so important is uh, you know i mean it's just not enough to understand okay i know how to read a balance sheet i know how to look at a profit and loss account or a cash flow i think it's important to understand how financially literate means going one step beyond to be able to analyze what the issues are in a balance sheet and just say you know last year this this much year that's not enough so financial literacy of a higher level you need to keep updated on what's happening the third is i would say regulators and uh, law and maybe because i'm a lawyer that's how i speak it is important for independent directors to understand clearly what are the what's happening around them in terms of uh, uh, policies in terms of law in terms of regulation who are the various regulators 
So uh, I think going forward, two of them already we have to do that. AI is the new subject, really. Financial literacy and as well as understanding of regulators and laws, something that we have been doing all the time and need to do more. But AI is something that we really need to understand the implications of. And I don't have a full uh, <laughs> idea of what it involves, really. So, right. I, I know AI is going to be both. Uh, it can be dangerous. It can be very helpful. Yeah, it's going to change the industry. It's going to change the manner in which industry is. Right. right. It, is, it, is, it is going to be a new paradigm. Uh, now, uh, I think I'll take, uh, I'll, I'll ask the last question before we... Oh, go to the audiences to Mr. Sanandhan, Santana Krishnan ji. Sir, you are a chartered accountant and you are the best person to read a balance sheet. Now, what are you, you mentioned about cash flow statement. What is the importance of an auditor's report or a board of directors report? Or what are the two points which you would like the independent directors to focus on besides cash flow statement? You should simply ask the auditors, uh, if you are an investor, have you got all the information? Uh, if you are the managing director, do you think you would have done it differently? These two questions will get the cat out of the bag. The auditors will say, no, I would have done. He starts, then you will know. Two questions. As an investor, do you think you would have done it differently? As a, If you are the management, do you think you would have done it differently? And three is the auditors know everything. These days, it has become the fashion for the audit committee and our board to say, we don't have time. We have only 15 minutes. That means at the beginning of disaster, spend maximum time outside the board meeting with the auditors, not finding out uh, other news, but finding out from them whether they have any concerns. What do you think are the major concerns? What do you think are the major strengths? Auditors, both internal and external auditors, would do a great job. And they will know everything of the other than the managing director. So spend maximum time with the auditors is very essential. Well, also, one of the other things you asked, uh, Madam Sampath mentioned, but I believe one of the most important talent for an independent director is common sense. Mm -hmm. There is no substitute for common sense. Absolutely. Whether you know it, uh, it's not possible for you to know everything. A leader yeah. need not know. The mm -hmm. prime minister doesn't know eco eco economic activities in the country, but he has to be a leader. For being a leader, he has to be the uh, yes, we have common sense. I thought we should add, in addition to three skills, fourth skill of common sense also to what we need. I believe in that. Absolutely, sir. You can you can always take a horse to the stable, but you can't make him drink the water. <laughs> so I think uh, this was very. It was very fascinating to hear such diverse perspectives. Uh, now we will open to the audiences if they have any questions. So uh, audiences, audience, if you have any question. Uh, you can uh, maybe put it on the chat box or you can open your mics and you can ask directly to the panelists. Uh, well, Mr. Makija, one question which has come directly from one of the participants yes, is sir. that I'll probably read it out to you. He says, yes. out of 168 uh, directors who have resigned, uh, only four directors have given reason. Balance have said personal reasons. Is Sebi or somebody should not uh, find out real reasons and protect the people is what he has said. I fully agree with him that uh, personal reasons also should be elaborated. Uh, that seems to be a ploy for coming out of an embarrassing situation without a disclosure. Right. Uh, senior company secretary, by name is Ravi, has sent this message. Me, Ravi. Okay, great, sir. Uh, I think there are a few questions in the chat box. I'll take one by one. I just read it for the convenience of the uh, panelists. Uh, Vasu Trivali, Trivali says, as in India, are there any other countries where IDs have any mandatory tests to clear? Also, follow up having mandated tests. Can government go one further step in giving list of ID choices and forcing listed companies to choose from that list, thereby ensuring companies don't choose compliant IDs? Uh, Mr. Mahalingam, would you like to take this question? Uh, that yeah. Uh... See, I personally, at least, I have not come across any other country where the IDs have to undergo a test. At least, I have not come across. But maybe here, with a series of frauds happening and people with uh, total, I mean, like uh, one of the speakers very correctly talked about financial literacy. If people don't have, finan not financially literate and going and sitting in the board, it does create a problem. So, MCA thought of that and uh, a kind of a route to find out the knowledge of the people, although I may not agree with that, perhaps we can't think of an alternative right now. I personally feel that, I mean, subjecting some somebody to a test at the age of about 50, 55, 60 may not be appropriate. That's what I feel. Okay, great, sir. 
Satish Panchal ji is asking, there are different regulatory institutes in India. Their responsibility is clearly defined. If industry is not compliant, then regulatory authorities must act on the occupier because he or she are dealing the daily activities rather than the independent. So the question they are trying to say is, the person who is in executive capacity should be targeted rather than the independent directors. So your views, uh, uh, Mr. Malikarjan Rao, on this? See, we cannot, uh, what do you call, uh, wish away the direct uh, responsibility of the independent directors because even before you say that the executive, the executive uh, what do you call, has to be held responsible, uh, the, there is a board which is taking care and there is a responsibility of the board as an independent director, as a member of the board, why we could not have acted to see that the company runs in a proper direction and compliance requirement. So uh, by saying that they should ask only the executive and not the independent director, I don't think I don't think <coughs> the correct proposition. Right. And Abhik is asking how to identify if fellow ID is really independent. So Sushvita so ma'am, uh, would you like to take this question? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a smell test in, in terms of kind of, you know, where all else is he there? If we find that he's nowhere else, but in a particular company, which is also fine. I mean, we all start with one company, but it also talks about the kind of background that we've had. But if, as I said at the beginning, I did come across a company where the other four directors were very, very young people. And again, nothing to do with age. We don't have to have white hair, but they didn't seem to have kind of, you know, relevant experience. So I, I, I think that's the, the, the smell test, see where else they are. Smell test. I think that's a wonderful word which you have used. Oh, yeah, correct. Sir, we can see two or three hands also. KP Vijay Kumar. Sir, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Because there are very long questions are there in the chat box. So KP Vijay Kumar, if you can hear me. Yes, sir. But can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. <laughs> sir, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, sorry, sir. Um, I am Colonel Vijay, sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Okay, sir. Uh, I just want to ask you one thing. You had mentioned that, you know, uh, the code of ethics is a very important factor. Uh, being a, to be an independent director, mm -hmm. another that you should be loyal to a company, you should be loyal to the organization. Do you think that we uh, military officers make an ideal candidate for the ID appointment? <laughs> Uh, well, if you if you ask me, as far as the loyalty is concerned, I simply mentioned that one should work in the best interest of the company. So rather than rather than saying the, whether the politicians are good enough to become an independent director or the 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 uh, service people are more important, it's not like that. The point is, everyone has to have that kind of uh, updation. And certainly, you have to have common sense. Naturally, our our service people who have been very loyal. Naturally, they they are the best fit for the uh, independent directors also. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. Thank yes, sir. you. Okay. Yes, okay. I think uh, we can take one more question by from uh, uh, Gupta Sun. I think uh, whether I'm reading the name uh, correctly or not. Yes. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, yes, sir. I hope everybody can hear me. Yes, uh, ma'am. Please go ahead. First of all, thank you for such an insightful session. I really appreciate that. Uh, but with that, I'll ask my question quickly. Yeah. So uh, in case the independent director and like for the sake of discussion, any director has not voted in favor of a particular decision uh, yeah. which is being taken in the boardroom. So how much he or she will be still held responsible for the uh, ultimate, like the results of that decision? So just curious to know that. Okay, uh, I think that's a great question. I think I can answer that. Being a lawyer also and, and also on the board, well, uh, you have to look at it from the point of view of the Companies Act today. Companies Act clearly says that silence is out of window. Now, if a decision is being taken in a board meeting and you have some diverse opinion, so please make sure that your dissent is recorded in the minutes. Because if you remain silent, Tomorrow, it can be taken up that, look, you never spoke about that particular aspect. Well, decisions can definitely go wrong. But if you have conducted your due diligence properly, you have asked the right questions in the board meeting and that information, based on that information, if you have taken the call or passed a board resolution, I think you have a better defense. So what I always say to all the independent directors, please create a safety net around you. And the safety net is not only by speaking, but also not by remaining silent. So if you have not attended the board meeting also, the board minutes are circulated, 
And if you come to know about the, uh, you see, board processes through these documents, even then you have to speak out. So please do that. I think you will uh, do a good job. Otherwise, you will have to hire a lawyer like me to defend yourself. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Really appreciate the answer. Uh, thank, thank I think, do we have some more time to take more questions? I have uh, one or two issues to... Please. Yes, sir. Please, please go ahead, sir. Please go ahead. I've got two issues to be raised. I would... Uh, want your opinion on the subject. One is regarding this DNO insurance policy. Now, this DNO insurance policy, uh, when you are in the board as a director, whether you are independent or executive director, if something happens in the board where the decision was taken, and later on the case comes up in the court, somebody puts the case in the court, Maybe after two years, maybe after five years, as you know, in the court cases take long time to come. So if the case has come up after five, six years, and you had left that board at that time, and now your DNO policy is not uh, there, the company is not there. So now is the company, uh, is, is it at their discretion whether they, whether they will give you the uh, cover, the legal cover, or you have to defend the case on your own? Okay, uh, I, I can answer that. See, the uh, first of all, we have to see the your tenure as a director. Supposing the decision has been taken during your tenure, where you were a part of it, naturally you will be held liable or responsible. I'm not saying on all the cases, independent directors would be liable, but because there are, there are internal instructions to the registrar of companies, and even I just read in the newspaper a few days back, the RBI has also given direction that please do not go after independent directors, those who are not in executive capacity. So therefore, you are protected from that angle. But yes, if the d and cover expires, then naturally you are on your own. So the, the director has to defend on its own. But there are certain things. Sometimes it is mentioned in the articles of association that in the in case of certain liability comes, the company will also indemnify. So I think one of the, um, uh, I think Mr. Malik Arjuna Rao, uh, you see, referred to the charter. So I will say articles of association, reading it, reading that is very important. Get it amended, put it in the article so that you can also be defended later on. No, but the fact so if I can just take one minute. I can just yeah. take one minute on his question because uh, even if, as long as the uh, incident relates to some uh, something that happened during your tenure, even if you have retired, you should ensure that the policy. It's important that you read the DNO policy that it extends even after you have retired or you left the board. As long as uh, uh, that is there, there is no issue at all. You will definitely get protection even if you are not a director on the board at that particular time, as long as the insurance policy terms covers that. And that's important to note. Okay, uh, great. Uh, just a point to continuation. It is true. It is correct what Madam is saying. Because for all the directors existing as on the day policy is taken, it is extended. It is not a question of somebody is there in the board or not. But so long as the issue is cropping up, the policy should take care of that. Right. So I think uh, that was, sir, do we have any other questions? Yeah, one more. Uh, this question is, <laughs> you see now, as far as the performance evaluation of the board is concerned, as far as independent directors are concerned, every year at the end of the year, performance evaluation is done in which the independent director's evaluation is also done. And based on the evaluation, then it is decided whether his tenure will be extended or not. Now, some of the independent directors are slightly reluctant to raise certain questions in the boardroom, thinking that if I ask the awkward question, the management may not like them, and it may go against uh, my performance evaluation. The other aspect is that in some of the countries, it is being advocated that this performance evaluation of the board, at least once in three years, it should be done by an independent uh, agency who are expert on this performance evaluation so that because at the moment it is only an in-house performance evaluation. It's within their own board. But if it is done by an expert independent agency from outside, then probably you'll get a better assessment of that. So on that, if somebody can clarify. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Mr. Malingam, yeah, Mr. Malikarjan Rao, yes, you want to say yeah, I just would like to add a couple of points. I do agree with uh, Lieutenant General Sudhir uh, in I am aware that in some of the companies, they do every year by engaging a third party agency and the evaluation mechanism also includes 
peer level understanding of the colleague directors and their observations on their performance in different committees it is captured in a very effective manner and summarized well to come out with the performance of the performance evaluation of the independent directors so in our country in our organizations it is there every year it is being done in some of them so yeah, it Malingam. adds to it adds to the credibility that's what you are trying yes Correct. yes mr malingam yes sir i have a completely different point of view here my point of view is it is basically the colleague directors who come to know how well that person is asking the question how have i how he is not reserved how he is not reluctant to ask questions now ultimately an external agency is going to come and interview you because they are not sitting inside the board room they are not sitting inside the committee meeting room they are nobody to judge you as to how you effectively you had i mean played your role so when they come and ask you questions and they collate the answers for these questions i feel that we are parting with a crore of rupees of 50 lakhs of rupees for, for nothing that we could have ourselves done so my thing is basically if people are true to themselves they are true to their conscience they will be able to evaluate the colleague directors without mm -hmm. any prejudice without any ego they are evaluating them on the value they brought on the table uh, okay. i think mahalingu sir i did not make my point clear the evaluation is done at the peer level i use the word peer level that means the independent directors each of them evaluating on others ah, and right, that is right. what is captured okay okay that is So right. there is there is a so very effectively done. Yeah. yeah. So evaluation yeah. matrix is decided before. Yeah, yeah. It's a peer level, peer level evaluation matrix. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I I I definitely agree with that, sir. So as we wrap up uh, today's webinar, uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for their very invaluable insights and our audience. I think there are a lot of questions uh, and a lot of hands I can see, but the time constraint is there. So I I really apologize to the audiences that we are not able to take up. What I request is all these questions can be compiled and by the IOD and of course maybe uh, FAQ can be brought in on those questions. I think that will be wonderful service to to all the independent directors. And I think I will thank also the audience for engaging with us through their very very thoughtful questions. It has been a rich and a great discussion. So over to you, Julie. Now for your comments. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mahjika, for that incredible panel discussion. And I, it sounds as if we could have another three hours of questions from, from the audience. Um, but I know that we don't have time for that. So thank you once again for facilitating the Q&A session. And thank you for all the speakers for taking time out to share their insights. And I'd like now, uh, now like to invite Mr. Manoj Rao, the CEO and Secretary General Institute of Directors, to propose the vote. of thanks one small intervention before manoj ji speaks i would like to thank all the speakers in fact i think they bring in excellent perspectives i think i get to learn a lot from these perspective every speaker here contributed his or her own point of view which has been absolutely educative thank you very much colleague speakers every meeting thank that you, you start with has been like this sir thank you mr malik thank you <laughs> thank you i would add to that thank you And Thank you. Complete. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. What a wonderful session, and really highly insightful. And we over three hundred guests joined today, mm -hmm. and really we are running sort of chairs, virtual chairs. We are deeply impressed by the success of this IOD Global Webinar. There were many questions. uh we wish we could have extended further but due to time constraint we will take this forward during our next webinar and moreover we will be compiling the reports and the questions we'll find we'll try to come out with uh, the responses and uh, the detailed report will be uh getting printed in our monthly magazine director today and also of course we'll be sharing with our nodal ministry ministry of corporate affairs and the regulatory sebi as we do each time so as we come to the concluding moment of this uh, this enriching webinar i'm honored and i'm extremely uh, you know uh, grateful to extend a heartfelt thanks to our uh, the distinguished speakers and our special thanks and our special thanks to mr g mahalingam 
who has been a great mentor to us and right from his SEBI days for his insightful guest of honor, the keynote address. And, and also I'm grateful to Mr. Dr. Asis Makiza for his enlightening keynote address. Um, we will never forget Dr. Makiza. He has been pillar of our strength right from the day that we started the first batch of masterclass for directors. Today, we are running over 470 batches. I still remember those days when we started our class uh, in the Divine Valley in Palampur, Himachal Pradesh. I mean, since then, I think uh, we consider, it, consider him as one of the auspicious pillar of our growth. Thank you. Thank sir. you, That's sir. Good. Thank you. And uh, my spe special and sincere thanks to Mr. Santana Krishnan. Um, um, I think recently uh, they celebrated. He's a very fine auditor. He runs a PKF, the audit firm, apart from his many board positions. And recently um, they celebrated the 45th anniversary. Congratulations to you, sir. And I was, uh, it was privileged to be part of it. Ms. Vijaya Sampath, um, I mean, I think uh, the way she handled and uh, led Airtel to make the voice of India to be heard at the global level, connecting all over the world and um, being part of um, such a powerful icon, uh, the Airtel. Mr. Malika Arjuna Malik Rao, uh, um, as a banker, thank you so for joining us. Ms. Uh, Sushmita Ghatak, I mean, okay. she also, she's also a fellow of IOD and uh, she has been one of our lead faculty for a number of boardroom sessions. So thank you all for sparing your valuable time and sharing such um, uh, great insights with our IOD family. And uh, last but not the least, and also I would like to thank our IOD president, General Nath, for delivering the president address. The insights uh, the shared today, um, it has clearly underscored the critical need for the directors, how to be, uh, how to remain vigilant and proactive in our roles. And also before we take up any ID positions confidently. I would also like to thank our IOD family, IOD fellows, members, those who have joined not only from India and various parts of the world, uh, it could be later in the late evening. Still, they have been, uh, still they joined us. And thank you for your commitment uh, to stay informed and also sparing your valuable time with us. I would also like to thank our uh, partners and supporters so uh, for their unwavering support. Our institutional partners, Gujarat Flora Chemicals, Gritsco Cybertech, and the strategic partner, NASDAQ US, and the knowledge partner, Paxman, so for all their support. So uh, reflecting on today's discussions, uh, it is evident that the role of independent directors is a complex and extremely special, uh, extremely crucial. Um, we could see these days the boards and uh, organizations are facing many challenges and many issues. So how we how how many such issues that we see them? It doesn't matter. And what it matters, how we see them all. Uh, like whether the glass is half full or half empty. So it is up to us how that we perceive, view them, how we consider them. Perhaps if media would have been. Uh, if media is there, they will, you know, uh, try to hit the headline that half of the water is gone. So this is how it is. So before I conclude, I wanted to share one food for thought. Now we see that our census has touched historic 81,000 mark now. Um, so uh, here the message is, how are earnings, our earnings growth also should match with the market evaluations? That's a big question that we have to see. Uh, it's a food for thought. So for all these, 
we require a good strategy to make informed decisions. So with that, with that note, uh, we have a very special talk by Julie Lewis. She is our co-host for this webinar. She is a professional speaker, author, and also an explorer. So she'll be sharing a special talk on emotional questions of independent directors. But before this, we have a poll. Uh, I think uh, I'll request Dr. Makiza. So uh, take that poll. Um, uh, there are two questions I think we missed out. Yeah, okay. So uh, in the poll, uh, just let me pull up that poll. Yeah. Uh, can can the uh, organizers help me in pulling up the poll? Yes, here we are, sir. Yes, so the... The first poll was, what is the most crucial aspect of due diligence when accepting an ID position? So can we show the answers there? So the question number one, I think uh, board and governor, the question was, what is the most crucial aspect of due diligence when accepting an ID position? I think after the talk, the, the uh, highest votes have gone to board and governance. Risk as management has got only 6% votes. Investor relations have got 3%. So Mr. Mahalangam would not be very happy to see this. Financial health of the company gets 22% and corporate culture and ethics gets 25%. Wow, this is this is just fantastic. Okay, so can we see the question number two now? Let's go to question number two. Okay, now uh, the poll is on the screen. So can we request everyone to be a part of the poll? Yes. Now the words have started coming. Very interesting question. Why do boards fail? Wow, this is this is just fantastic. We still have some time and a lot of people are voting. 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, 30 seconds. And I think 117, 18 votes have already come in. So 124, okay. So when do we end that? I think uh, oh, okay. and, yeah. now it is ended. So why do boards fail? The first option, lack of diversity, gets only 2% of the votes. So can we share it on? Yeah. Lack of accountability gets 22%. Poor leadership and lack of direction gets 45%. Ineffective communication, 8%. Conflict of interest, 10%. Insufficient expertise gets 13%. So poor leadership and lack of direction. I think the audience is absolutely right. 45%. We'll go with the audience. <laughs> so over to you, uh, Manoji and Julie. So for your uh, very, very insightful uh, talk on the... the thank you. Yes, thank you. Over to Julie. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, because um, um, I met Manoj in Dubai earlier this year when I spoke at the TriStar event on International Women's Day. And so um, he mentioned the Institute of Directors India, and I was very intrigued. So I feel very honored that I've been able to join you today, a little bit like a fish out of water because um, it's not my lane, but I have learned so much from every single one and the questions and the content. So thank you, thank you uh, so much for that. I'd like to start my short talk with a, a quote by Lao Tzu, which is, stand like mountain, flow like water. And I think whichever business we're in, there are times when we do need to stand strong like a mountain, uh, stable, resilient and grounded and weather the storms. And there are other times when we need to be more like water uh, and flow like water and be adaptive and receptive and flexible like water. So I work with teams and organizations who want to build resilient and healthy teams who will succeed through calm waters, and stormy waters so that they can navigate challenges and change. And the emotional quotient that people talk about, I think it's so important, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, but our emotional um, fitness and flexibility really helps us understand and manage our own emotions because if we're to lead by example, it's important that we come from a position of strength um, and then effectively connect with others. One of my favorite Greek uh, philosophers, Socrates, said, know thyself. And I would like to extend that to know thy emotions, know thy values, know thy strengths, 
and now know thy board. <laughs> I think that makes sense with this meeting. And, you know, when we know ourselves and we know the people that we're working with, it lends itself to better decisions, stronger relationships, um, more clarity, more focus, being calm and having a positive working environment, basically. So in my latest book, which you'll see a picture of, and I happen to have copies here, all good authors have copies of their book on hand, is the big sister to my first book, which was called Moving Mountains. Uncharted Waters was really um, a deep dive into the element of water and how much it's connected, emotions are connected with water. When we think about water, it's the only element that can exist in three forms. It adapts to the environment it's in. When it's very cold, it freezes, yeah? It cannot be contained. Frozen pipes will burst and water will go everywhere. So it's the only element that can exist in three forms as a liquid, as a solid, and a gas. And how useful would it be if, as human beings, we could adapt to the environment that we were in, the circumstances, the situation, the environment, and the people, and actually change form or change perspective or give our perspectives. So that would really serve as well, I think, in business and relationships and life to be very adaptive and very flexible to check the environment and the circumstances and respond accordingly. Now, water can be very calm and soothing, but we all know it can also be very disruptive and turbulent. So to be able to manage that is a superpower. The Dr. Wallace J. Nichols is a marine biologist that talked about something called the blue mind. Has anybody heard of this? A little show of hands, maybe blue mind. What this is, it's the calm, meditative, focused, clear thinking state whenever you are in, on, around, or underwater. Now, I'm not suggesting you go scuba diving and have your board meetings under the water, but it could be that you have um, a water feature or that you do a walk and talk, that you have, you drink lots of water. So basically a blue mind is what we're aiming for. A red mind is a stress mind. And we all know that when we have a stress mind, we don't necessarily make the best decisions. So, and further on from that is something that's known as a gray mind. And this is when we're burnt out we, even though we've got piles of things to do, we're just overwhelmed and frazzled. And burnout on boards, I know exists because I have several friends on boards. And the importance is to be able to access your blue mind through meditation, through being in nature, through staying hydrated, etc. So my latest book really draws parallels to physical, spiritual, emotional uh, intelligence to the element of water. And during the talk today, um, the power of questions came up quite a lot about asking lots of questions before, during and post board. And, you know, one of the powerful questions we can ask ourselves is, what do I need right now? Or asking board members, what do you need right now? Right now being the operative word. So I'm very, very big on the power of questions. And we are 70% water. The planet is 70% water. So one of my favorite quotes when people are feeling challenged is to say, Remember you are water and water always finds a way. It will get through the smallest crack, the thinnest, tiniest thing. It will always, always find a way. So being more like water is the key to emotional flexibility and fitness. And I'm going to close with a quote that I found from the current prime minister of India, Narendra Modi, which relates to water conservation and emotional well-being and it reads water is life conservation of water is our duty it is important step to ensure the well-being of future generations just like our emotions water needs to be managed wisely to maintain balance and harmony so i would like to close by saying i wish you balance and harmony on your boards and remember, be like water. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for the wonderful talk and also being uh, such a great co-host. And 
ladies and gentlemen uh, you know, we... before we wind up can i ask a question to julie please. yes please go okay. ahead okay julie where uh... can you buy my book yes no, i that... think every board course... director should have a copy of the book yes. uh, amazon is i think our is our best friend for amazon the... always <laughs> yeah yes So no, my my only question was, uh, how do you see build the adaptive resilience which you just talked about? I mean, can you just yes. give one example? I mean, like like in the boardroom or in a personal life. So yes, do, yeah. yes, yeah. I think you know, there's there's five elements. I do a lot of talks with organizations on resilience, and you can actually measure it. There's an RQ as well. There's EQ, RQ, PQ, SQ. There's a lot of Qs. um and really it's about you know first of all being optimistic whenever we start a project we go, we're with an optimistic mind if we're a pessimist we've already beaten ourselves up and and given ourselves not such a great chance yeah. the second one is to be able to focus on solutions because we often sit in a boardroom or in a, in a meeting and we're discussing what your situation is so that's great i would say spend 5 minutes discussing the situation and spend the rest of the meeting focusing on solutions what else what else what else the other one is to be accountable you know to be impeccable with your word there are four agreements in toltec wisdom be impeccable with your word don't take anything personally don't make assumptions always do your best the other one is being open and flexible it's not my way or the highway i'm quite socratic in my leadership skills that i ask for people's opinions I know that I may be the one that has to make the decision but everybody feels engaged and has got their buy in. And then the other one is really managing stress and anxiety because from a mountaineering point of view the mountains that I've climbed when I get closer to the summit there's less oxygen in the air it's harder to breathe. I have to decide what I'm going to carry up that mountain. What can I let go? What can I delegate to? So I think delegation asking for help is a sign of strength. adapting to the environment that you find yourself in um and and making changes for that and so from standing strong like a mountain but sometimes you know you've been continually weathered by the storm sometimes we just have to decide to let go and go with the river and know that the river's flowing to the ocean so adapting to the environment that we find ourselves in the circumstances the situation but also the people that we have around us in your terms you know the board of people that are, who's on the board how can we adapt to working with each other do we know each other's strengths do we know our values do we know our emotional priorities so you know i've been in um at high altitude adapting to cold weather and less oxygen um six years ago i attempted to swim from england to france so then i was in cold water dirty water smell of diesel a big shipping line i had to adapt very very quickly to that environment and um so it's just really being very present and very aware um and very conscious you know and asking lots of questions i hope that helps you know because we all find ourselves in in strange especially when we travel you know the minute you go to a new country you're asking where's this how do i get there how much is that where will i find you know become neurally alive so when you join a board i think as i draw a parallel i think it was you know play to the rules of the game know your know your board ask lots of questions um you know build trust yeah yeah great i think one single word to describe your your book and whatever you said phenomenal <laughs> phenomenal with a p i've always yes. been impressed by that word but phenomenal i think how do you know do you spend that when i was a little girl i remember going the phenomenal is per nominal that's our english language for you <laughs> almost as complicated well, as your names right. <laughs> <laughs> yes which are beautiful by the way yes true, true, true. yeah yes thank you all so uh, thank you for, for such an insightful talk julie and um, so together let us contribute to the iod's mission piloting a silent revolution within the boardroom i think the the uh, as you rightly say um i think we now uh, we have to bring in um the emotional uh curtain of uh, the independent directors as a mainline module in our boardroom training sessions also so our the second oh, webinar <laughs> Yeah, and the second webinar of this uh, the IOD 
global webinar series will be focusing on ESG and net zero, uh, the targets. So see you soon again. Till then, stay vigilant, stay informed, and continue to lead with integrity. Thank you all. Have a nice evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.